Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 34 of Interstellar Quest and we are with our Moho return vehicle. Remember this autonomous spacecraft which was going to fly past Moho, collect a bunch of its secrets and then ultimately return to Kerbin. No doubt travelling at interplanetary speeds when it does so. That's why it has a giant heat shield to protect its very small payload. The heat shield weighs more than the space probe itself. So we're just making some final course corrections to make sure that we actually fly by Moho exactly. As it happens, uh, when I switched to it, it had lost its encounter due to, I don't know, the vagaries of floating point arithmetic and, you know, borderline values and things like that. This is a problem in Kerbal Space Program. It's not generally a problem in the real world. Uh, one of these days, someone will fix it. I've heard that somebody is working on an N-body system, although uh, we'll see how, how that actually does, because uh, if you use the wrong set of N-body you know, preconditions, then you can have the moons of Jewel being very, very unstable, particularly because Tylo is so massive. Anyway, getting the Moho periapse down to under 30 kilometers so that we can get the high above Moho science and the low Moho science. The low Moho, as they say. Yeah, that will uh, <laughs> it'll be close enough to see some gravitational effects, but because the planet Moho is so light, it doesn't really make a huge difference to our orbit. You're not really going to be able to slingshot around this thing and adjust your trajectory by a huge amount. It's entirely reliant on this engine doing all the operations. And we have now entered Moho's sphere of influence. I am feeling the influence of Moho already. Let's see if the scientific instruments are seeing the influence. Goo, what do you say? Goo, report. It seems that the goo canister is an excellent fusion reactor here. Oh. It stopped. Well, I'm sure the guys back in the lab will be fascinated by this new discovery. Next up is the Gravmax negative gravioli detector. The sensor passes over the terrain of Moho, surveying for variances in the gravitational field. So, generic uh, insert planet name here message. The solar wind seems to be being deflected, and we'll get some science back from that. Even though we've maxed out our transmission, we uh, are going to be able to bring it back to the planet Kerbin and our people will be able to dissect the instrument. Uh, there's the temperature, the thermometer. Log. Oh, yeah, of course, we can't do it at this altitude. Uh, anything else that I can bring with me? The seismic and the press mat barometer will not work. We have to save, you know, copies of each experiment for the close pass. Yeah, I guess it is down to the science junior. The materials react to the situation. Mission Control comments on your vagueness. And now, having exhausted all the science we can get at this altitude, let's ahead for our close encounter, set a timer up, set an alarm clock for it. We want to make sure we do not, do not fly past it because we are moving at 4.3 kilometers per second and will not be there for very long. We'll probably get up to maybe 4.4, 4.5, maybe if we're lucky. But uh, really, we're going so fast that the gravitational field is not affecting us a huge amount. Okay. Let's see, we're ready to go. we got to wait until we are close enough. I'm not sure what altitude that actually is. I'm just going to guesstimate that it's about 100. And 100. Okay. Are we ready to risk some science? Some science from Moho? There we go. Observe Materials Bay. The material reacts to the situation. Mission Control comments on your vagueness. Yes. Uh, the goo. The mystery goo. Want some tea? That's great. What else do we have? We have the Gravmax negative gravioli detect. Oh, wait, we've lost it again. There's the thermometer. This wasn't tested for such temperatures. Minus 144. Yes, not tested at minus 144. The sensor passes over the terrain of Moho, surveying for variances in the gravity field. And we have an antenna thingy. The magnetosphere sees the magnetic field seems leaky, but surprisingly strong for a body of this size. Moho clearly has a strong magnetic field, which I believe I've commented on the real Mercury having a surprisingly strong magnetic field considering its size. Well, there's some theories that Mercury has relatively high levels of iron because 
uh, its surface is more or less getting, in the early solar system, was getting blasted by big impacts and this kind of lighter stuff got knocked off, or rather the stuff near the surface got knocked off, whereas the stuff near the core was protected from being eroded. What a beautiful sight as our spacecraft heads off back into deep space. Yeah, at uh, 4.4 kilometers per second. We never managed 4.5, but we will probably be going even faster when we arrive back at Kerbin because we're going to have to perform a maneuver that brings our apohelion or our aphelion way out so that Kerbin can catch up. And yeah, this is us just getting set up for that maneuver here, a bunch of maneuver node manipulation. So the idea is that since we are way ahead of Kerbin, now we have to take make a maneuver that will uh, let Kerbin catch up on us, right? So we're going to do some stuff adjusting the adjusting the inclination as well. So we're going for that second node there. You see it? So we're trying to line that up. I'm, I don't want to go too far out because if I go for the first node, then I'd be traveling really fast. We want to make sure that we're going slow enough that we don't burn up, but also so that we can take advantage of this engine to slow our approach once we actually get on that terminal approach to Kerbin. And yeah, just burning the engine, of course. We're going to need a further course correction later from this, but uh, it, I think we actually might even be able to just put ourselves into orbit around Kerbin. I, I've built this thing to return at about 5 kilometers per second, but... I've actually had the experiments die due to excessive g-forces. That was the message. I'm not sure why that happens, but a deadly re-entry is responsible. Anyway, on to our second spacecraft. This is the solar, the sun skimmer. If you remember, it has previously passed close to the sun. Well, we tr passed close and we transmitted all sorts of fascinating scientific data. But now we're going to do it again. We're going to collect what data we can. Obviously, we can no longer use the goo and the, uh, the what do you call it? The uh, we can't use the 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 exposure thing. The readings are off the scale. Perhaps the heat is causing a malfunction. Yes, minus whatever centigrade. Seismic accelerometer useless. Gravioli detector. Let's log this data. The manufacturer's manual for this instrument is telling you awesome things that I didn't bother to read. Thermometer. Wow, this place is almost as hot as the surface off the... Oh, wait. Minus 201 degrees notice. Those temperatures are being produced by deadly re-entry, by the way, which is more concerned about the temperature being generated by flying through the atmosphere at really high speeds rather than, say, sitting next to a giant ball of burning hydrogen or pla hydrogen plasma. Anyway, so we've set up our return. What we're going to do is burn at perihelion, and now, again, we'll do the same thing. We're going to raise our aphelion apo, up and more or less set ourselves up with an encounter of the planet Kerbin. Now, we don't have nearly the delta V that the nuclear-powered ones have. So, at best, what we're going to do is slow ourselves on encounter with Kerbin, put ourselves into some sort of orbit with aerobraking, and circularize it so that we can send an astronaut out to actually pick this data off. That's the plan, and I have no idea if it's going to work, because this whole thing could just disintegrate under the aerodynamic forces of aerobraking. We can't really, you know, we don't really have many options. We could wait until there's like a perfect return option, but uh, either way, we're going to be moving about, you know, seven or eight kilometers per second when we encounter Kerbin. And I don't know how much delta V we actually have in that little engine. There you see, once again, flying up high so that Kerbin catches up and then we're going to scream past it. I mean, another option is that we try to send a spacecraft out to actually rendezvous with this thing at, you know, 10 kilometers per second or whatever. We, you know, we have options here. <laughs> it's going to be fun whatever happens and it's it's really not that far away we're going to set up a we're going to do another maneuver at uh, Apple Apps or actually no I guess, I guess we're setting up a maneuver for um, our actual return 40 days out now now we have one more mission one week has passed since our previous alarm clock check in this is going off towards Drez no, we already have a spacecraft going towards Dres. Uh, if you remember, we have that 
uh, electrically powered plasma thruster that's moving at a really high speed. This is going to travel at a little more sedate pace. It's got a the nuclear engine on it. It is basically a copy of the spacecraft that we are sending to ELO. It is going to land and actually in this case it may have enough delta V to return although it may take a really long time to do so and by pro probably by the time we actually get it able to return we will have unlocked so much science that we'll be able to send a super powered spacecraft out there on a plasma thruster that lets it travel at really high speeds and things like that. But it is an opportunity that is not to be missed and since I am trying to fill my uh, my spacecraft time with lots of launches, you know, every seven days we want a launch to happen. Uh, no, no more than every seven days as well, because, you know, we want to make sure that we do actually get to Duna. We're basically scattering our spacecraft liberally around the Kerbin system so that they may bring back the fruits of their labors. And yet, once again, you remember we have to turn this engine on without jettisoning the shroud. If we do that, then um, bad things happen. <laughs> As in, things explode and our engine is gone. The antenna... Well, yes. That's what happens when you do four times time acceleration, by the way. And that's four times time acceleration on top of the video acceleration. This thing just wobbles like something insane. Even with Kerbal Joint Reinforcement, which I have installed. Even though people keep telling me I need it. Uh, I think people just overestimate the capabilities of Kerbal Joint Reinforcement, as amazing as it is. So you might have noticed we have gone into a polar orbit here, by the way. And the reason I'm going into a polar orbit is because Dres is actually quite uh, inclined. And I guess my goal here was that because I'm in a polar orbit, I can adjust my departure time and more or less aim for the specific inclination change that I actually want and try to pick an inclination that will mean that I have to spend less effort later. If you're doing this from an equatorial orbit, then it actually takes more delta V to get a decently high inclination change. So this actually works out better, especially if you're not sure of your actual final trajectory, as I was, as in I was completely making it up as I went along. So yeah, the, the polar trajectory is fine, but the only thing is once you put it in the parking orbit, you pretty much have to depart within a couple of days because the polar orbit has to go along the sun, like the day-night terminator on the planet. And as you as planet Kerbin moves around the sun, so this line moves, but the orbit you're on does not move. And again, this is really something peculiar to Kerbal Space Program because... In a real space program, you would have probably calculated each orbit before you had even launched your spacecraft. And that's really not something that's easy to do. It'd be nice to have some sort of tool to estimate what your ideal inclination, your ideal like parking orbit would be for departure to an inclined target. I'm not really aware of anything that would let you do that. Perhaps you could, you know, throw a, a test body up there or something, you know. It'd be nice to have a mod that just says, put a test body in this orbit and let me muck around with its maneuver nodes. There, I've said it. What a brilliant idea. Go on, do it. Go on, modding community. We know you're capable of doing amazing things and making the game far better. Seriously, Kerbal Space Program uh, is a game that is vastly improved by the mods. The, the main game is great, but the pace of development simply can't keep up with the army of people that have cool ideas for things that they want to have in the game like life support and you know certain times of nuclear and electric drive systems communications uh you know, clouds on the planets my god i so want that to be part of the real curb and those clouds look amazing maybe not the city lights i they don't need to have the city lights if they decide that that's not in fitting with the kerbal culture kerbal background but Having the clouds, wow, that is a huge bonus. And seriously, squad, that's what needs to go into point two four. I'm I'm not kidding. I I know you know the guy that developed this mod worked very hard on it, um, and it would kind of you know ruin his work. But uh, all the same, it'd be really nice to have Ker Kerbal clouds because it makes the game look so much better. I'll obviously, have an option to turn it off for those people that don't have amazing graphics. Uh, cards those people that really want to you play the game with a on a shoestring budget should still be able to because after all we do want to support things like you know schools 
And we've almost got ourselves an encounter. There, there we go. So we're going to have a 645 meters per second burn. That will be 25 days out. And the actual encounter with Drez will be way further in the future. I won't be surprised if the Falcon has returned by then. And a week after our departure for Drez, we are sending three astronauts back into space. We are going back to Minmus for many reasons, but the main reason is we haven't really been there since they added biomes to Minmus. And I've developed a lot of new technology since then, and I think that it may prove an ideal base for a refueling uh, facility in space, or at least out of the gravity well of Kerbin. Now, uh, this spacecraft does look like a giant RPG, and I mean rocket-propelled grenade, not role-playing game, although if you are a Dungeons & Dragons playing member of the military, that could be a confusion that you have to deal with. Um, no, it's just got a very large fairing on the front because the crew have to sit in... So the, you know, the payload is horrifically unaerodynamic given that it's f designed to fly in space. Uh, it's actually not that massive, we just need a huge fairing, and speaking of which, I have no idea how the crew could have got into that fairing. They must have built the fairing around the crew while we were inside the vehicle assembly building, and then they've been sitting in there for several days, cooling their heels while the spacecraft was rolled out to the, the launch pad, and I don't know, they've obviously been eating their snacks and doing Kerbal things or something like that. You know, just waiting. They haven't seen the light of day for a while. And uh, they'll no doubt be happy once we can actually ditch this fairing. Which will happen soon enough. There we go. Beautiful. Separating away three pieces, returning to the planet Kerbin. While we continue to our destiny with the sky. Now, the design of this spacecraft and the launch window I picked basically means we're not going to go into a parking orbit, we're just going to more or less burn straight for Minmus. Uh, I, I kind of ended up going with aesthetics versus actual you know, good design, and my fuel margins are a little close on this one. Just a little close. So I can't afford to stop, I have to basically keep going, keep burning. Uh, forgetting the target, the, the parking orbit. My only fear is that my uh, upper stage may not return to Kerbin, and that would be not a terrible thing, but it would be... There we go. Oh, that'll be fine. It will return, and we will continue on our voyage to the planet Minmus, to the moon of Minmus, to find the new secrets that Point24 has brought us. So it, it doesn't accelerate at a huge rate, and now looking at that, I think we need to actually burn downwards to align our orbit just a little. So we're going to be burning downwards, and that will actually push our... It'll actually push the uh, the the ascending node, or the, the line of nodes, in slightly the wrong direction, but it will reduce the angle. That's the main thing. So you see I'm burning slightly southwards. And that will take a while, because so we're doing four times normal speed, so you can appreciate the, the majesty of this voyage without having to deal with the tedium of this voyage. That's the wonders of Kerbal Space Program. So there you go. You see the nodes are actually moving towards Minmus, but the actual angle is decreasing, so ultimately it means that we'll need less... Ex less um, Less of a correction once we get there. Now, we want to be absolutely careful here because we are very, very tight on our fuel margins, as I said, because I wanted a spacecraft that looked pretty cool. Uh, we have a lot of stuff strapped onto this, and there's a special surprise in store. Can you guess what it is? Well, I'm not going to tell you until the next myth, next episode, but this is going to mark a new, uh, a new chapter in space-based construction, at least for me. <laughs> So you're just going to make a little adjustment here so that we actually encounter the planet, uh, encounter the target. Never, not a planet. It's not a planet. It is a captured body that has perhaps a large degree of volatile, um, volatile materials in its middle. At least that's what I, I like to think. Some people think it's ice. Some people keep saying it's ice, even though ice would melt at this temperature. But perhaps it is ice. You know, some way below uh, the 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 blue, the turquoise surface of this planet, the pudding-colored surface, the pudding moon, as they say. There is a great Kerbal legend that talks about the time when the pudding moon will rise and a new king shall be declared, King Jebediah. Yeah, there, there you go. That's the prophecy, right? <laughs> 
I'm just imagining, oh, wait, we've lost this. For some reason, it lost my encounter. So I'm like, am I really going to encounter this or am I going to fly by? No, I totally encountered it. Flying over the South Pole of Minmus, we're going to go into... Uh, well, actually, this is this would have been great because we'd never go into communications blackout with the planet Kerbin. And also, it looks jaw-dropping from here. Anyway, we will land in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.